there are those that refer to these as the gay lifestyle. The gay lifestyle. The word gay, folks, look it up in the old dictionaries, means happy or exuberant. Happy or exuberant. Right? We used to have a book sitting on the shelf when I was a kid. This is how to throw a gay party. I'd be afraid to have one of them today. It wouldn't be the same thing, would it? No. Now why? Well, it's because there are those out there, your revisionist, that have perverted the Word of God. Remember where we started out in 1 John chapter 2, verse 21? But it says what? No lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Now, I'm, I'm amazed at how easy it is for the world out there to get people, Christian people, that should know better. Uh, I just had a pastor on a program who kept referring to the abortionist as a doctor. Let me ask you, see, who in here can tell me what a doctor or a physician does? What is their their duty? Save lives. Save lives. Heal. Prove lives. To Thank save you. lives and to heal. Now, abortionists do neither, do they? So that if an abortionist performs mass murder, then an abortionist is what? A mass murderer. See? And this is what you need to be able to defend the Word of God. It's called apologetics, right? So when 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 the world comes out there, instead of instead of allowing yourself to be beguiled and in, indoctrinated, and that's what's happening. This is why I tell you, whoever frames the debate wins the debate. Amen. You are to be bold. The Bible says. In Proverbs 28, verse 1, the righteous are as bold as lions. Bold as lions. Bold! What does that mean? That means when they come and they, they make statements like this, and they, they say, well, uh, I'm gay. You say, you mean you're a sodomite? <laughs> yeah, right. You're a sodomite. Now, I, I've asked them, when these people told me that they were liberal, you know, I, you know I've asked them, do you, do you have sex with animals? I ask you why not. You see, because under their definition, you have to, you have to understand this. They have to be totally anti whatever the Bible teaches. This right. this progressive, these teachings come right from Karl Marx's playbook. It's totally in opposition, in total opposition of everything the Bible teaches. Everything. In fact, like if I were to ask you this, is it a, is it a sin to lie? Yes. Yeah. Well, under Marx, and under their playbook, it's mandatory. Now, under Islam, lying is you can uh, you can do it if you want. You know, uh, lying is not mandatory, but it's permitted. You can lie to uh, a non-Muslim, or you can lie to your wife. Lying to your wife is is permitted, uh, or to well, lie to any of your wives. Or to anybody else's wife. But you're not supposed to lie to other Muslim men, okay? But you can lie uh, to any of the heathen, right? Or the non Muslims. But under communism, lying is required. Karl Marx said this that you've got to learn never that the issue is never the issue. The issue is never the issue. In other words, you, you have to learn to say this or to say that. To go this way or to go that way, okay? But the issue is never the issue. So, and then he talked, always do the opposite of what you say. Now, I don't know if you folks have been noticing something, but <laughs> Obama has been consistently doing exactly the opposite of what they say. And do you remember Bill Clinton with Monica Lewinsky? What did he say? Deny, 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 deny. We, we had the tapes of that. We had the uh, tapes that, that made it public. Just deny, 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 and lie. Okay. In fact, one of Bill Clinton's famous sayings used to be, uh, who are you going to believe, me or your lying eyes? Yeah. And for you folks that don't know here, I, I knew, I worked with Bill Clinton's bodyguards right. very closely, those that were with him for years as his bodyguards. I had them on the radio program. I spent quite a bit of time and they they would tell me the whole history, what he would do from morning to night. 
And uh, in fact, there's a fellow named Stanislav Lunov, which is the highest ranking defector from the Soviet Union, a full bird colonel in the grid, okay, which is their equivalent to our NSH. They're the real covert action. And they told me, uh, he told me that he went down in December of 1969, spent two weeks uh, in Moscow every single day with Bill Clinton uh, preparing him to become President of the United States. That was in 1969, the indoctrination. Mm -hmm. To show you, Matthew, I'm going to put this here. And anyhow, what we have today too is the inversion of morals. And what we have to do is we have to learn to stand, or to give the right answer. Turn to Isaiah chapter 5 for a minute. In Isaiah chapter 5, we read this, starting in verse 18. Woe unto them, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity, and sin, as it were, with a cart rope. He's saying, when you, when you get a woe from God, a woe from God is not a good thing. When, when God lays a woe on you, you're about to get hurt, okay? And he says that, that draw sin, draw iniquity with cords of vanity, as it were. It's like that they've got their sin in a cart, and they're pulling the cart in front of God, okay? And then they say, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel <coughs> and I and come, that we may know. In other words, they're saying, let's see what God will do when God looks upon our sin. As we flaunt our sin out in front of God, let's see what God will do about it. Amen. Well, folks, I, I'll tell you what God will do about it. Okay, God is a holy God, and the holy God judges sin, and the holy God punishes sin. Right. Mm -hmm. and you remember some uh, years ago there at the Kent State, oh, yeah. where you had these National Guardsmen that they kept up for about two days, they had a real tired. Uh, you don't ever throw rocks at a, a man who's been without sleep for a couple days and standing there holding a rifle, okay? You see, because if you throw rocks at a man, it's that, he'll shoot you. That's what he'll do, you see. And uh, here, if you, if you go and you draw yourself, now, now remember this. God can't be tempted. So, if you, have you ever seen these young punky boys that get up on the college campus and they'll find a platform and they'll stand up there, Hey God, if you're really up there, strike me with lightning. <laughs> See that? I've seen them do this, right? Now, if these boys are so stupid to think that they can tempt a holy God, look, look. God is not only the present, he's the past and the future. Remember that fellow called Herod the Magnificent? Well, you see, Herod the Magnificent, he got himself in some trouble with God, you see. And what happened on that special day was his birthday. And there on that special day, he was dressed in his birthday suit, a suit made of silver. And he stood up on this platform, and all of those, those people all those merchants that were trying to garner his approval for the trade routes to come through, well, they came out there. And as Herod the Magnificent spoke, he waxed eloquently. And the sun was shining upon his suit of silver. And they yelled out, you're not a man, you're a god, you're a god. Now, folks, he wasn't no god, you see. And he was about to find out in spades that he was no God. Because right there on the spot, he was eaten alive by worms. Now when you're out there on your birthday, and, and you're eaten alive in front of the people you're trying to impress, you're not having a good day. Okay? So Herod didn't, see Herod should have said, no, I'm not a God, I'm not. He should have read his robe and said, don't say that. Like the other people that, even old Elvis Presley, remember old Elvis Presley? Elvis was doing a concert one time. I was watching that concert. And 
right up in the, in the front row, these women, a whole slew of women, they got up and they had a banner about as long as this room almost, and they stood up and they held this banner and says, Elvis is king. Elvis feared God. He stopped the concert, said, take it down now. Jesus is king. Take it down, you see. Do you know why he did that? He knew about what happened to Herod the Magnificent, you see. And he didn't want to get a case of worms right there at that concert. Right? So, here now he says this, Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light, light for darkness, put bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. That's exactly what cultural Marxism tells you. Always do the opposite of what you say. Always say the opposite of what you're going to do. Tom and I used to put on a skit. We, we ought to do that when I would go speak. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. We ought to do that skit sometime to, to show you how they work. Do you remember how it was done? Yeah, there was, yeah, it was vaguely, pretty much. Okay. Want to try? Yeah, come on up here, sure. See if I can remember. This would be. Okay, now this is the way the communists to work, you know, remember. Okay. That uh, the idea, Karl Marx says too, and, and Barack Hussein Obama literally came out and said, we are going to transfer the wealth, redistribute the wealth from those, and he said this, that have earned it, he said this, those that have earned it, to those that deserve it. Meaning, if you, whatever, if you have a business, you didn't start your business. If you, you know, listen, we did. You know, I didn't get any help from the government, wouldn't take it if they give it to me. But anyhow, Tom, you know, I've been kind of, you know, I appreciate, look, yeah. I've been living off you for a lot, I've been enjoying the fruits of your labors, uh, but Tom, you know, you got to, Oh, you hit me. I'm offended. I am offended that you would say, if you accuse me of hitting you again, forget it. I'm not going to live off you anymore. Somebody else had to live off you. You hit me again. No, you're supposed to say, I felt like you hit me. No, you're supposed to go, I know you didn't hit me because you just told me you didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> Boy, it felt like you did. Yeah, I can that. But you see, but that is like... I know you didn't hit me. No, I can't, I, I can't keep hitting you. Because <laughs> 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 What's the line? Give me that line. That's one part. The, that part was, I know you didn't hit me because you, hit me. you said you didn't hit me, but it sure felt oh, like you hit me. Okay? And that's the way communism <laughs> works, folks. They did that. Jim for That's that hit me again. Jim, we're going to get Jim back but you see, but some of his ex-students like to come up and... and <laughs> but you see, that's the way they work. It's, it's delusion, right? And what you guys got to do is you got to stand up to that and say, no, wait a minute, that's not true. That's a lie, right? When they, when they make these statements, this language of illusion, you know what? I've been in a lot of debates, but I've never lost a debate. Not because I'm a great debater, but because I know the Word of God. And I know my material. And I, before I go, I make sure that I know what I'm talking about. You know why? Look, the Bible says this, that we have obligations to God. That we never, ever give God anything less than our very best. God never, no, not never, no, not ever, ever, wants, expects anything from us than our very best. Remember what Jesus did upon that cross? He didn't hold back anything, did he? Okay, now listen. He has expectations of us. And that's what we have to do, try to live up to the expectation. And that's why you have to be prepared always to give a right answer. So when they come along with this language of illusion, you, what do you do? You refute, you rebuke, and you exhort with all long suffering. Okay. In other words, you correct them, and then you encourage them to start telling the truth. Amen. Amen. So, so when they use that word, gay, what do you say? Sodomite. You say you mean sodomite, sodomite right? Okay. And the, the Bible says that is the very first term that that is an unclean, 
Right. Okay, when they said that they were born that way, what do you say? They said, according to the word of God, that's a lie. Right. According to God's word, now you see what you do. You know what? Tom knows this. I've been sued, you know, about as much as anybody I knew yeah. over the years. And shot at, too. Yeah, I've been shot at. They tried to stab me and everything else. But we've won every single case. Every one. Now, often, I would have to defend myself. If I'm the only one that's involved, just me, if there's nobody else to bring any charges on, I can defend myself in my venue. And guess what? I teach biblical law. Guess what my venue is? You see this? This is a King James the Bible. Now, I can go in to the court when I'm on this. This is my venue. With only King James Bible. You couldn't do it now. With a new King James, you couldn't do it now. With an NIV, an ASV, or any of those. And the reason for that, when they ask you what sovereign nation has given this as a book of law. King James of England, 1611. This is the accepted book of law. The only Bible right here that you can do that with. And throughout most of the world, most of the courts, this is allowed. Guess what happens when I go in there with this? 15 minutes, they want me out. Just leave. Get out. Right? That's what they do want. You know why? The Word of God cuts both ways. I'm in. And if you knew how much power you had in this, very few people understand that. But that's what you had to do. You had to stay with the Word of God. Here, turn to Proverbs chapter 24. In Proverbs chapter 24. First, I want to start over here uh, in chapter 23. In the chapter 23, I'm going to read verses 12 through 16. Apply thine heart to instruction, and thine ears to the words of knowledge. Withhold not correction from the child. If thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt, not, thou shalt beat him with a rod, and shall deliver his soul from hell. My son, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice even mine. Now, yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things, right things. Now what does he tell you? Today, if you correct your child, what is it called? Abuse. It's called child abuse. This right. is the language of illusion. That's right. Just, they will tell you, just do the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches you. And what happens when children grow up today that are not being uh, corrected? Out of control. Well, They're in jail. I spent the last 42 years going to prisons, and one of the things that just most of these inmates have in common is no father in the home. Oh, you take the father out of the house, and folks, you got a problem there with these boys. And I, I learned something because I was under the impression that without a father, that it would draw the mother and the, and the, the children closer together. In, in some cases, that's happened. But usually, without the father, it makes these young men anti-woman. It gives them, makes them angry towards their mothers. And, uh, yeah, well, that's the way it is. And many of them today are in prison because they had no father in the home. And today they're told, uh, I had a foster child. Charlie McGeever was his name. He, was, he had the very worst behavior record in the entire history of the orphanage uh, over there in Parma called Parmadale. He had, they were, and this, this orphanage is almost 200 years old and he had the worst behavior record, Charlie. Now, how did I end up with him? Well, he was big for his age. And I was teaching, which was not an easy task at that time, 
I was teaching eighth grade and ninth grade boys in a Bible study at, for Willow Hill Baptist at Lakeland Community. And while I was teaching that class, right outside the window, the Browns were practicing. They had the Browns camp right there. And they'd be right outside. And I even found myself wandering over, watch, looking out the window, even, you know. And so it was hard keeping the attention of those boys. But Charlie managed to, to uh, well, he didn't tell me the truth about his age. And he lied to get into the class because he was big for his age. Nobody doubted him, okay. And the next thing I knew, uh, the boy called me up. He was sick. He was sleeping on the floor of a pizza uh, shop uh, all the way over there by where Pastor Dale lives. And so I went over to get him, and he was in a foster home. And I took him over to the foster home, and it was a disaster there. Uh, the man of the house came out and said, said, the best thing you could do is take this boy and just go someplace else. See, Charlie's, Charlie's had a bad background. Uh, at the age of seven years old, Charlie's mother, when, when the welfare check would come out, uh, she would take the welfare check. It was not unusual for her to be in bed with two men at one time or more. Okay? And I found this all out. And she would take the money and, they would, and she would leave Charlie to watch Jason, who was five. She'd be gone for two weeks until the money ran out. Then she'd come home. Charlie learned how to work this, the streets. This kid was one of the best con men you ever want to see. I mean, this boy was a little con man. And, uh, uh, and I told my wife, I said, look, I got to tell you something. Before you decide to take this boy, now this boy is going to lie to you. This boy will steal from you. This boy will break your heart. Now, you have to understand that going into this. You better be prepared for this. And uh, she said, you're taking a very negative outlook. I said, I'm taking a reality check. Listen, I know the boys, I know the streets, okay? Boy, did he lie to her. Boy, did he steal from her. Uh, one day, she'd gone out and spent a ton of money on a, a new computer and everything where the kid would come home and was gone. And uh, he had traded it for some stuff. But, uh, to show you what a good con man he was, one day I'm in my office and one of the guys that were working for me came in and said, hey, what's Charlie up to? I said, what do you mean? He said, Charlie's got a, a great big truck full of candy over there, and he's got these girls stationed all along the whole shopping center, about every 50 yards of park, selling candy. And I went over there, and sure enough, he managed to do it. How uh, a 12-year-old kid could pull that off, I don't know. But that's what he had at that time. And they were selling the candy, and the raise the money was for a fundraiser. They were handed to church. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but uh, so what happened was, I went and I made sure that all of the, the money and the candy and everything was accounted for. But all of a sudden, we ended up missing $280. It was, uh, you know, he had done about a $1,200 worth of candy dealings down there. And I paid it, I made good for him because he was my boy, but I put him to work. I made him work to, to work that off. And then one day, uh, a couple months later, he was in this room and he looks up at it <coughs> like this. And I ran in there to see what was wrong. He had hidden that money in a book. And what he would do is he would take a book and he would cut out the inside. He was hiding cigarettes in there and he hid that money in there. And of course, I was the one buying him the books and giving him the books. Okay? He had found that money <laughs> and that he had taken and he had hid. And he, he took the weapons rather than turn the money in. And he had forgotten all about it. Because his, you know, in those days, those kids, their attention spans not real long. But anyhow, getting back to Proverbs 24, verses 10, 11, and 12. If thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. If thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, 
And he that keepeth the soul doth he not know it, and shall he not render to every man according to his works. But I was a young guy after World War II. You had uh, a lot of these German immigrants come over here after the war, and they would work it for my dad and my uncle. I asked him, I said, you know, why did you guys let Hitler do that? I was just a kid, okay? And uh, their faces would turn beet red, and they would say, we didn't know what was going on. Every one of them, listen, they didn't know what was going on. Their faces wouldn't be beet red folks, okay? They knew, but they didn't do anything. Why? They were afraid of Hitler. Here, if thou sayest, behold, we knew it not, that not he that pondereth the heart consider it, and he that keepeth the soul that he not know, shall he not render to every man according to his words. You know what that means? God, Jesus, preached more on sins of omission than he did sins of commission. In other words, he preached more on what you failed to do than what you did. You see? You just it's just a big a sin. If you fail to feed the hungry when you can, it's just a big a sin if, if you starve them. You see? And if you fail to rescue those being led to slaughter and drawn to death, it's a sin just like it is to kill them, you see. And we're talking about the babies. That's our job. That's why you be doers of the word, not just hearers. What does it say? Deceiving yourselves. Deceiving yourself, right? Well, then I want you to go down here to verse 21. Verse 21. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. There's only one Lord and one king. Lord of Lord, king of kings. Amen. And that's the Lord Jesus. And what does it say? Meddle not with them that are given to change. Meddle not, you know. And they, did you ever heard a slogan say, hope and change? Yeah. Hope and change? Well, after that hope, all you had left was change Amen. in your pocket. But he's telling you that the change that he's referring to, these people coming saying, oh, we got a new way of doing things, you see. And remember, Obama said that his salvation was a collective salvation. Now, what is a collective salvation is, under cultural Marxism, what they call liberation theology, which is the joining of what they try to join together the teachings of Marx and the teachings of Jesus, called liberation theology. And under that, what they call a collective salvation means your salvation is tied to everyone else in the collective. But their salvation is not eternal life in receiving the Lord Jesus Christ when he, and being covered by his blood and having your sins taken away. No. Under liberation theology, collective salvation, and they actually have, I preached in a church, and in their track rack, you know what they have? They have tracks. And Jesus is wearing machine gun belts, gun belts, and a bandana. He's a rebel. He's a communist rebel. And their salvation is, when he comes back, <coughs> that he is going to liberate all of the, the poor people from the capital. And he's going to take from the capitalist and give it to the, redistribute it to the poor. Now, folks, that's called communism. Amen. It's called communism. And that's what, we are a nation today that is under communist occupation. If people understand that. Our White House, the enemy is in the White House. He's in the Justice Department, right. the uh, Education Department. You know, this is a reality. This is where we are today. Just as we occupy other countries, our nation is occupied today. That's a reality right now. And again, it's, uh, it's incredibly shameful how easy uh, those that should know better, how easily they're, they're, they're bewitched by the world into turning the truth into a lie. Look, here's what it says here. My son, fear the Fear the Lord and the King. Men will not with them that are given to change, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of person in judgment. He that saith unto the wicked, Thou art righteous, 
him shall the people curse, the nation shall abhor him. But to them that rebuke him shall be delight, and a good blessing shall come upon him. Every man shall kiss the, kiss the lips that giveth the right answer. Now you will hear people say today, well, if you don't respect the man, at least you should respect the office. Do you remember that fellow named John the Baptist? And he said, Herod! Herod! You've taken your brother's wife. What did he do? He rebuked Herod, right? Yeah, he lost his head. But I can tell you this, John the Baptist has got a high place in heaven. Amen? Amen. And amongst Jesus said, amongst men there were none greater ever born of a woman than John the Baptist. And two, if you have a wicked person uh, and you give that wicked person accolades, remember, he tells you you are to re render to who render is due. To call the wicked, the evil good, that is a sin against God. Just like when you call an abortionist a doctor. You do that around some real doctors and I can tell you, you'll hear from them in a heartbeat. They'll tell you, don't refer to him as a, a doctor. He's not a doctor, okay? And I feel the same way when they refer to these apostate preachers as men of God. We had one down at Warren Correctional. The chaplain down there was a Satanist. He was in there handing out satanic tracts. But he was under the Department of Religion. And one of the corrections officers says, you, you want to stay on that guy's good side because uh, he's got a link to God. Yeah. <coughs> well, book publishers today are busy revising and redefining uh, the definitions of marriage, and I'm going to have to stop now because of time. I'm going to get into that this week. Marriage was the very first divine institution that God gave man. Listen, this is settled law. Marriage is between one man, one woman, one lifetime. That's settled law. That's over 6,000 years of settled law. Now, what they call marriage, don't ever say that same-sex marriage. That's right. If someone says to you, well, that's same-sex, you say, what? What? No, no. Maybe same-sex mirage. You know, mirage is something that doesn't really exist. Right. Say, no, you don't understand. That, that's not marriage. That's right. You see, because... Marriage has been defined by God 6,000 years ago, one man, one woman with God. That's what marriage is, one man, one woman. Okay, Jesus said the two, right, will become one flesh. We have some of these, these clowns that we hear from that's always talking about having more than one wife. And most of these guys that I, I know that are talking about having more than one wife. Most of them can't handle the wife they have now. <laughs> and, and the others can't get a wife to begin with. And they're talking about having more than one. Okay? <clears throat> so, when they say that, what do you do? Okay? If I say, Big Jim, uh, he's involved in same-sex marriage, what do you say? Say that's political correctness. You're, you're absolutely say, well you just told a lie because that's not marriage. Marriage is between a man and a woman. Right? You gotta step up, folks, and be bold because you've got the truth on your side, amen. Amen. Okay. I, I like it, you know, I've only got halfway through this message because it's a, a long message. And uh, that would be probably to half seven if we continue on this one. Tonight. Next week you're going to have uh, Pastor Musselman, or yeah, Bruce Musselman. He's going to be here. Now Bruce is a scholar, very scholarly, on the King James Bible, and he's going to be telling you why this book stands alone. Okay, see, this is the only authorized book of law. This book was authorized in 1611 by the sovereign nation of England. This is the only Bible I can defend myself with. And I can only defend myself in our statutory courts if I'm the only one that's involved. If anybody, if Tom gets involved, if they accuse him, 
Right. And they'll do that just to make sure. And the reason is, if there's one other person involved, then I try to defend myself. They charge me with practicing law without a license. And you know it's got nothing to do with it. Right. And our judicial system, right and wrong, has been turned upside down, inside out and backwards. Oh, man. And we have a very corrupt judicial system yeah. because we live in the evil day just exactly. Right now, if you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, lifetime, that's where we're at. We're seeing it right now. Those are the days we're living in. And here's the good news in all of this. There's never been a better time in all the history to, to place up crowns in heaven. Yeah. You see, when it's the darkest out, that's when your light shines the brightest. Amen. Yeah. So you've never had a better time. Remember, God raised up the Old Testament prophets for their day, the New Testament prophets for their day. He raised up the founding fathers for their day, and He has raised us up for this day. Amen. Now, folks, we're either going to run to this battle and give it the best we've got, and remember, what did it tell you in Romans? He that is in us is what? Greater. Greater than he that is in the world, right? We either run to this battle and place up crowns in glory and spend all of eternity glad that we did. Mm -hmm. Or we're not going to run to the battle and have all of eternity to which we have. Boils down to that, doesn't it? Man. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask a blessing and take up an offering. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we gather here today, Father God, Lord, none of us chose you. I know. I know people often will say, I found the Lord. Well, we know that you were never lost, Lord. And that you've said in your word that no one seeketh after you, no, not one. You found us. You called us. And Father God, by thy grace, are we here tonight. And Lord, we, we know that it's an honor and a privilege to be found worthy to come into thy presence, Lord, and, and to, to be used of you in such a mighty, mighty way. So we thank you and we praise you, dear Lord, Father God. And again, as we go through this life, we would ask, Father God, that you, first of all, would bless our brothers and sisters throughout the world in a persecuted church. Lord, knowing, Father God, what it's like to suffer for thy name's sake. As, as we know, the persecution of the church is greater today than it's ever been. You would never know that by watching the lamestream media. Father God, again, and, and we know, Lord, that it's coming our way, but, Lord, we know that it, we need to, to look up it again as a privilege to be found worthy and to be persecuted for thy name's sake. These things we ask as we take up an offering, let none of us come short, Lord, in any, anything we do, Father God, for you. Let us do exactly as you've told us to give our very best to put, not put anything ever before you. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Kevin, would you and Big Jim take up an offering? And then we're going to take the Lord's table. Now, when you take the Lord's table, uh, it's very important that you understand some things. One, that you, first of all, you have to be saved, a born again believer. Number two, that you've been baptized by immersion. And number three, and this is the most important, that you have no unconfessed sin. God's Word the Bible means exactly what God's Word the Bible says. So that uh, before you do that, you have no unconfessed sin. Uh, did you have it ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Kevin, uh, Tom, do you, would you also assist yeah. Kevin? man examine himself, and so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. when he had given thanks. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as we come before you, Lord, we thank you that we are able, Lord, tonight to be a guest at thy table, Father God. Not through our own merit, not because we're worthy of our own, but Lord, through thy grace, because of <coughs> the sacrifice that was made, and that our sins were covered, were taken away by the blood of Christ. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus. Take heed. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, take heed. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Amen. Who needs prayer in here tonight? Is there anybody that needs prayer? Actually, there's nobody here that doesn't need prayer. That's the reality, folks. Uh, if you're if you're alive. And